So for number, number 17, they're asking us to figure out what the delta G for this acid dissociation reaction is under the following conditions. And so for this question, we're going to have to use the full version of our delta G equation where we get our delta G for non-standard conditions equal to our delta G standard and then a term to consider that we're not at equilibrium. Okay, so that delta G standard tells us something about the energy associated with getting to equilibrium. And then the RT, L, and Q accounts for the fact that we're not at equilibrium. And so what I'm going to do first, they give us a KEQ. So the first thing I'm going to do is just write my KEQ expression. We'll have the acetate anion times protons divided by the acetic acid. Okay, so for this problem, there's kind of two steps that we have to go through. And the first one is to figure out what our delta G standard is. And we can do that just by using our KEQ value. So usually in these problems, there's one of two ways to figure out what delta G standard is. Either you use the KEQ like we will for this problem, or you might have to do products minus reactants when you're given the delta Gs of formation but those are both ways to figure out your delta G standard for the reaction. So I'm going to plug in R in kilojoules form. Times our temperatures. We're at 25 degrees Celsius. So this is going to be 298 Kelvin. times the natural log of our KEQ value. It's 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. And so when we plug this in, our delta G value will come out in units of kilojoules per mole. And it's 27.15 kilojoules per mole. And it makes sense that this number would come out to be positive because our KEQ is really small, right? It's less than one. And so we know that we're reactants favored and that we would expect a positive delta G standard. Okay, so we figured out that term for our overall equation. And now we need to figure out the RT, L, and Q portion. And we can start by just making sure we know what our Q is. So for Q, we're going to plug in these concentrations that they've given us into the same expression we would use for KEQ, which is our concentrations aren't at equilibrium. And then we can solve for Q. And our Q is 2.5 times 10 to the minus 9. And this value is much, much less than our KEQ value. So that tells me we must have too many reactants, and the reaction is going to proceed in the forward direction. And because the reaction is going to proceed in the forward direction, I know that our non-standard delta G is going to be negative. Because this value is telling me about in the direction we're going, are we headed toward or away equilibrium? And so here we're going to be moving toward equilibrium in the forward direction. And so we'll have a favorable spontaneous delta G. Okay. And so now we have a prediction 
we have our Q value and we have our delta G value. So we can plug these numbers into our overall delta G equation. So we'll have our positive 2715 kilojoules per mole. And again, you want to make sure you have your R units matched up correctly. So I'm doing everything in kilojoules. And then we plug that in and get negative 21.92 kilojoules per mole, which corresponds to answer choice B. And so that's the amount of energy that's going to be released as we go from this initial concentration set to equilibrium. And that reaction will be spontaneous, and it can do 22 kilojoules per mole work every time it goes. In number 18, we're looking at how the free energy can change with the extent of a reaction. And we have a bunch of different points marked here. And so they tell us that point A represents the energy level of the reactants and D represents the energy level of the products. We're picking what's true. So let's go ahead and address the first question or the first option. It says point C represents equilibrium. So equilibrium is going to be when we have the lowest energy. And so that is going to be point C. So that one checks out. The valley or the bottom of that valley is always going to be equilibrium. You can think of it as the happy valley if you'd like to. Okay, so that one's true. The second one says at point B, Q is greater than KEQ. So here's point B. And I think it really helps to down here at the zero, go ahead and write that that's where the reactants are. And over at one, right, this is where we'd have 100% products. And then point five is where we are 50-50. You can even think of it as like 50% each. So at point B, we're more on the reactant side. We have more reactants. And if you think Q is like product over reactants, then that would tell us that Q is going to be less than KEQ. So that's true. Okay, then we are looking at arrow E. You see that's the delta G standard for the reaction. So we know delta G standard is just going to be the difference between products and reactants. And that's what our arrow is corresponding to because point A is reactants and point D is products and that's just the difference between them. Okay. Then the last one says at point D delta G equals zero. Okay and so we know that delta G non-standard equals zero if we are at equilibrium. And we already said that point C corresponds to equilibrium so point D is not where delta G is going to be equal to zero. So that answer choice is false, leaving us with D as our answer. Okay, we have another true-false question. And it says, for the first one, when delta G is greater than zero, products are form favored at equilibrium. And so we know that if we have a positive delta G standard, 
that actually our KEQ is less than 1 and reactants are favored. And so A is going to be false. And then for B it says when Q is greater than K, the reaction will shift to the left to form more products. And so this is something we've addressed already, but when Q is greater than KEQ, if it's products over reactants, that means we must have too many products. And so the reaction has to go in the reverse direction to the left. And that would correspond to a positive delta G non-standard. Okay, and so this option choice looks like it's true. Well, let's go ahead and address the other ones also. So it says a process has only reached equilibrium if Q equals 1. And so that's not going to be true. The answer is going to be if Q equals KEQ, then it will be at equilibrium. And KEQ is not normally 1. So C is false. For D, it says when KEQ is greater than 1, the reaction mixture is mostly reactants at equilibrium. So if we think products over reactants for KEQ, if it's greater than 1, our numerator must be bigger, and our numerator is products. So this one's false. For E, the forward rate is only equal to the reverse rate when KEQ is less than Q. And that's not true. This will happen if we're at equilibrium. Right, that's our initial definition of equilibrium. And we're at equilibrium if Q equals K EQ. Okay, so our answer choice here is just B. In question number 20, they give us delta G is the formation for individual molecules. I want us to figure out what the equilibrium constant for the reaction is going to be at 25 degrees Celsius, which is, of course, just 298 Kelvin. Okay, so if we want to relate energy to KEQ, we're going to have to use this equation here. But the thing is, is that they don't give us overall delta G for the reaction. They give us the delta G's for individual molecules. And so we're going to have to use our products minus reactants rule. So we can go ahead and say our delta G for the reaction is going to be equal to our products. So our CO2 plus the value for water minus the value for our protons and for our bicarbonate. Okay, and then we can plug in numbers for that. So for CO2 minus 394.4, we're always being careful with our units. So we mark that this is kilojoules per mole. Plus our value for water, which is minus 228.6 kilojoules per mole. Minus both our value for proton, zero, and bicarbonate, which is minus 587.1 kilojoules per mole Kelvin, or just mole. And so as you probably can tell, our value is going to pop out in kilojoules per mole. And that value is negative 35.9 kilojoules per mole.
And it makes sense to me that this is negative because if you've ever seen someone put baking soda in a volcano and pour vinegar over it, you see that, you know, there's all this work done in terms of volume changes. And if you were to put your hand next to it, it gets warm. So it makes sense that this would be spontaneous. Okay, so I'm going to make a note of that delta G standard. And we can use it with the equation above to figure out our KEQ. So we can go ahead and say our delta G standard is equal to R in units with kilojoules, negative 0 0.008314 kilojoules per mole kelvin times 298 kelvin times the natural log of KEQ. Okay, so we can divide our delta G by our negative RT. And we get that 14.49 is equal to the natural log of KEQ. And so E to the power of 14.49 will be equal to KEQ. And when you punch that into your calculator, you get something like 1.96 times 10 to the 6, which would correspond to answer choice B. And it makes sense that it's a really big K because we had a negative delta G. That delta G tells us we're going to go favorably toward products, so it makes sense that our KEQ should be large, telling us that products are favored. For number 21, they want us to pick which molecule has the greatest gas phase entropy at 500 Kelvin. And so when we're trying to decide between different molecules and their standard entropies, usually we're looking at phase and temperature first. But here they tell us that they're all gases and they're all at the same temperature. So now we have to look at their structures. and the first thing we want to look at is the number of atoms, number of bonded atoms. Because the more atoms you have in your molecule, the more configurations that the molecule can twist into and all these different ways and positions that they can line up against each other. And so that would be more disorder, more microstates available to sample. Okay, so if we're looking for more bonded atoms, that means A, B, and C are all out. Okay, they're going to have lower standard entropies. And so now we have to decide between D and E. They have the same number of bonded atoms. Then now the difference is chlorines versus fluorines. So when you're deciding between different atoms, you want to pick the bigger bonded atoms. Because those big atoms have a bigger electron cloud that can be squished around into more different ways. And so it'll have higher entropy. So we'd have to look at the periodic table decide if chlorine or fluorine is bigger. And chlorine is down a row from fluorine, so it must be bigger. So D is going to have our highest gas phase entropy. Okay, so number 22 is bringing back some of our kinetics understanding. And this is important because our definition of equilibrium started with kinetics and rates. 
by saying that the rate of the forward direction is equal to the rate of the reverse direction at equilibrium. And so for this reaction, I started out by just writing that equivalence. So this is just saying my rate forward is equal to my reverse rate. Okay, and we can rearrange this equation to go ahead and say we'll move over the kr. And so on one side we can have kf over kr. And then we can divide over that. And we get our product over our reactant. And this is how we get our KEQ value, which they say is 125. Okay, so they want us to figure out the half-life for the forward reaction. And we're treating this as an elementary reaction, so we can go ahead and say the forward reaction is first order. And so we eventually want to go ahead and say T1 half is equal to 0 0.693 over kf. So to get kf, we're going to use our relationship with kf over kr being equal to keq, which is 125. So we can go ahead and say kf over the KR that they gave us in the problem of 0 0.021 inverse seconds is equal to 125. And so with just some easy multiplication, we can find that KF is equal to 2.6875 inverse seconds. And then that's the number that we can plug into our half-life equation. Let's say T1 half is equal to 0 0.0693 divided by 2.6875 inverse seconds. So I realized I had made a little bit of a, a typo, a finger O in my number there. So I adjusted my KF number. I just had made a little sig fig error and put that new value into my T1 half equation and you get out this point zero or zero point two six four seconds for the half life. Okay, so it's really tempting to remember only this portion of the KEQ relationship, but don't forget to include that KEQ is also equal to KF over KR. So number 23 asks us to figure out what types of parameters will give us a reaction that is non-spontaneous at all temperatures. So to do this, we're going to have to use our go-to thermodynamics equation and think about how we manipulate it. And so we remember, first and foremost, that a positive delta G is going to be non-spontaneous. whereas a negative delta G is going to be spontaneous. So, looking at this equation, if we have a negative delta H and a positive delta S, we're going to have a negative number minus a positive number, which it doesn't matter what T is, it will always, always, always give us a negative number. Okay, and if instead we have a negative delta H and a negative delta S, now it does matter what our temperature is because if we have a negative delta H and we end up 
adding a really small number to it, then our delta G will still come out to be negative. But if instead we multiply this by a really big temperature, now we'd be adding a huge, huge, huge number. And then that positive number would win out and our delta G would be positive. So what I'm going to say here is that when we have a negative delta H and a negative delta S, we'll have a negative delta G at low temperatures. So we can kind of remember that as minus minus low temperatures, right? And then if instead we have a positive delta H and a positive delta S, now it's our delta H that's the problem. It's positive. But we have a positive number minus a positive number. So again, we can kind of think if we were to multiply this by a really big T, then we would be subtracting a really, really big positive number. And the delta G would become negative. So what I'm going to write here is when they're both positive, delta G is negative at high temperatures. So since the enthalpy is the unfavorable term, we have to magnify our favorable entropy term by multiplying it by a really high temperature. Okay, and so that brings us to the last case where we'd have a positive delta H and a negative delta S. In this instance, because I'm going to have a positive minus a negative, I'm going to have a positive number and I'll be adding something to it, no matter what that temperature is. So under these conditions, this will always be non-spontaneous. Doesn't matter if we heat it up, cool it down, it's not going to be spontaneous. And this makes sense because we have an unfavorable positive enthalpy and an unfavorable negative entropy. So no nothing's really going our way, so it's never going to be spontaneous. Okay, so this would be an endothermic reaction with a negative delta S. In 24, we're trying to figure out which reaction is going to have the most negative value of our standard delta G. So we remember our standard Gibbs free energy is related to our KEQ. And we know a bigger KEQ is going to be more products favored. It's going to be more in the forward direction. And that's going to mean a smaller standard delta G. Okay, so we just want to pick the reaction that has the biggest KEQ. And for this problem, that's going to be E, because it has the greatest KEQ. And if you really wanted to, you could go ahead and plug all of these KEQs into the equation to get the standard delta G value. But I think that would just be a little bit of a hassle. Okay, and we can end on an easy one here. They ask us to figure out the equilibrium expression for this reaction. And so we know it's going to more or less be products over reactants. But one of our rules for writing K is that we don't include solids or liquids. Yeah, that says liquids. No solids or liquids. Instead, we just use the number 1 for them. Okay, so when we go to write our KEQ expression, we'd look at our products, and we only have a solid available, so we'll just put in a 1. That'll be divided by 
our concentration of CO2 gas. And then we have another solid. So we can either ignore it or just write in the number 1. And that's just going to be 1 over CO2. Which is just answer choice C. Okay, so that's it, everyone. Good job. You guys can do this. Just remember to be careful with your units. Don't be a calculator superhero. Just take it one step at a time. Don't try to plug everything in all at once. And also try these problems with your Chem 112 calculator. Okay, you want to make sure you have all of the order of operation stuff figured out before you show up in Thomas or um, Forum or wherever to take the exam. Okay, so good work. You can do it.